got an email from them. I guess they thought they couldn't get in, but they're not going to be speaking yet. So I told them I will let them in once they're in. So that hand should be going down, I think. So you're ready. Okay, perfect. Them, I guess they thought they couldn't right. get in, but they're not going to be speaking yet. So we are on YouTube now. In, so okay. 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 All right. So I'd like to call a regular meeting of Empire Town Council for Tuesday, May 25th, 2021, to order at 6 30 p.m. Roll call, please. Councillor McGee? Here. Councillor Toner? Here. Councillor Burnett? Here. Councillor Grinstead? Here. Councillor Strike? Here. County Councillor Lynch? Here. And Mayor Stack? Here. Okay, in the land acknowledgement, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we work and gather is the traditional and ceded territory of the Anishinaabe Bay people. This Algonquin nation have lived in this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of the European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. Adopt the agenda, please. Be resolved that the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Tuesday, May 25th, 2021 be adopted. Mover and seconder. Lisa, Tom, any comments? All in favor? Carrie, thank you. Anybody have a disclosure of pecuniary interest? Just myself. I do have one that's pursuant to subsection 5.1 of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, RSO 1990. Council members must complete this form, and, and I've completed it to the council. Uh, to the council meeting at which they are making a declaration. So I declare that uh, <clears throat> items uh, on 11A on the council meeting of May 25th, 21, as well as potentially the uh, bylaw on section 15A1, should it be uh, approved, that I have a financial interest at 89 John Street North in Ampar. I've signed it and will provide it to the clerk later. And I'll ask uh, when those items come up for the deputy mayor to, uh, to address them. Any questions from previous business, Caleb? No? Okay. Do not see any hands raised. Thank you. The minutes, please. Let the minutes of the regular meeting of council listed under item 6A on the agenda be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Dan and Lynn, any comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. So we have no, uh, yeah, we do have a delegate presentation and a delegation tonight, right? So the presentation yeah. is uh, first, I guess Jennifer is going to introduce that one. Thank you, Mayor Stack. Um, Kale is bringing them into the meeting now. Um, I want to introduce uh, Serena Deschamps and Howard Allen. They're our municipal auditors from Allen and Partners. Uh, they've been with us for three years now, and uh, I just want to thank them in advance for uh, everything they've done to get these uh, statements through for us. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to them for their presentation. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see those. I'm just going to make sure. That's good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. So uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity just to review the statements. I mean, 2020, as we know, was a very different year for all of us because of the implications of COVID-19. And I think initially, um, certainly Ontario municipalities were fearful of the impact I know that in larger centers, uh, they have had some dramatic impact, in particular, um, when you look at those that have a lot of money tied up in transportation services, um, buses, subways, things of that nature. And of course, uh, there's also an impact on other areas, hospitals. Uh, and for us, I think one of the areas that impacted Iron Prior was recreation and culture. And so our recreation facilities uh, weren't used as much. We didn't raise as much uh, in fees that we had in previous years. And you can see when you look at your revenues for the year, which are around 20 million, uh, they were slightly under for the year. 
And, and one of the main reasons was the uh, recreation and culture area where we didn't have the fees for the pool and the, the uh, center that we would normally would have. Of course, when you look down, our expenses were a little bit less as well in that area. And uh, our net revenues over the year were actually uh, higher than what we budgeted. We budgeted about 2.1 million and they were 2.3. So very, very close when you consider the amount of the budget. At the bottom of the statement, you'll see there's other revenues and those revenues relate directly to capital projects. So gas tax funding, the donations, they relate to the, um, uh, feel, not the, the rink of dreams, I, th I think it's called, uh, that you did with the senators and, and local builder, or uh, Minto, I believe. Um, so again, I, I mean, that was not budgeted for initially in our budget, but those donations were happily received in the, in the town. And uh, the developer contributions, I mean, these come from development charges. So overall, the surplus under public sector accounting standards was in the range of, of 3.5 million, uh, more than what we budgeted. You'll notice at the bottom of the statement, there's an adjustment to municipal equity for $211,000. And this adjustment is because the airport no longer is consolidated with the town's financial statements. Now, Serena, are you here? I can't see you, but I think you're listening. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Okay. So maybe you could uh, explain uh, why we're no longer including the airport in these statements. Uh, so really the reason is that I believe during 2019, late 2019, the structure of the board of the airport was changed such that the town no longer controls the, the board. So because of that, despite the fact that we still make a nice contribution to the airport every year, uh, that it's no longer controlled by the town, we were not required to consolidate the operations into the financial statements anymore. All right, so that, that so an adjustment was made and, and uh, their results aren't included here. But of course, when these are consolidated statements, it does include uh, the cemeteries, the BIA, and the library. I think those are the three uh, entities that we consolidate. If you go to the next page, um, this is the statement of changes in net debt. Now, the town is in a net debt position just because if we added up all our liabilities, all our financial liabilities, we actually have a net debt position, which is not unusual. Uh, because of the infrastructure that towns have to uh, uh, finance and, and uh, maintain. So you'll notice again, this statement starts off with our annual surplus for the year of 3.5 million that we just looked at. And then you can see that we add to that amortization because we're trying to find out where did our cash go that we raised. Some of it goes to pay down debt and some of it goes down to, to buy capital assets. So we budgeted 3.1 million. Um, we didn't spend all the money. I think uh, there was a, a fair size project on Alicia Street that uh, the town didn't get to in 2020. Um, but as you follow down, I mean, we anticipated that we would uh, have a decrease in net debt this year of about 3 million, but in fact, it's closer to 5 million. And, and largely because we raised more money um, in our surplus and we didn't spend as much money as we anticipated on capital. So if you look at the end of the year, our net debt at the end of the year is uh, 3.9 million compared to 8.8 .8 million in the previous year. The next uh, slide we kind of have is the balance sheet or the statement of, of changes in financial position and you'll notice there that we do have um, a nice increase because of our surplus this year of about 15 million in, in financial assets. Our financial liabilities are, are down to about 19.4 million. And you can see our net <laughs> debt position of 3.9 million, call it $4 million. 
Of course, we have a lot of non-financial assets. I mean, these would be buildings, equipment, roadways. And you can see at the bottom, their depreciated value is over 100 million. It was interesting, this last year, the C.D. Howe Institute uh, looked at municipal finances and they thought that, you know, municipals were, uh, municipalities were, were uh, really uh, too well off and they should be spreading the wealth around. And uh, I think they, there was a good response from the uh, Municipal Officers Association of Ontario, where they took exception to the C.D. Howe's position and said that really, uh, although it looks like we have a great equity position, our equity is all in the roads and the hard assets that we need and infrastructure that's required in water and sewer to manage our municipalities. I just wanted to look briefly at, um, you know, sort of a five year financial review. Um, it sort of just shows the numbers um, for assessment. You can see that our assessment is growing. Uh, one of the things, as you know, the government basically has frozen the assessment for taxation purposes for the last two years. Uh, I'm really wondering, and uh, I don't know, maybe members of council have heard something. I haven't heard anything as to what impacts decision, what the provincial decision will be going forward. There's been such a spike in housing prices. Uh, it seems to me that people are going to get a shock uh, when they get their assessment notices. And it's going to be uh, hard to tell what the real impact is going to be on individual houses uh, if they just look at sales. So I think that's something the government's going to have to come to grips with because really right across Ontario, there has been a dramatic shift. I think I heard you earlier tonight in the pre-meeting talking about houses and house prices in, in Arm Prior. Um, in terms of our rates of taxation, I think, again, for a urban area, a small urban area, at 1.4%, if you were to compare yourselves to other towns in the area, I think you'd find that is a very competitive rate. Um, one of the things that has been a uh, change the provincial government made this year, which I think is positive, um, is that the commercial business education tax rate is, is dropping. For some reason, education taxes for businesses were higher in Eastern Ontario than they were, for example, in Southwestern Ontario. So the province this year did reduce the rate. Um, the rate for commercial education was 0.125 and they dropped it to 0 0.088. So our commercial and industrial rate payers in Eastern Ontario will appreciate that, uh, that fact. And that was announced by the government this spring in their budget. Tax arrears, I mean, Jennifer and her staff have done an excellent job in this area. I mean, the, the rate is down below 10%. I mean, I know they've worked hard uh, at collecting taxes, but even when you consider it through this year of COVID, in fact, our, our percentage of outstanding tax arrears is lower than it was in the previous year. The taxes that we transfer to the county of, of uh, 4 million and two and a half million, um, you can just see the trend. And, and uh, we are sending less to the school boards because the government gradually is, is trying to reduce that amount. Um, and it should be funded, they think, by the province. Um, again, a summary of our revenues that we've looked at, but just a five-year summary and expenses. Our net financial assets, I think it's good to note that the province thinks you're in a low-risk position if your net debt is 20% or less than your operating revenue. And you'll see this year, uh, for the first year in five years, our net debt is, is just under that threshold. So they would consider us to be in a low risk area. And they also look at your net debt and say, if it's less than 50% of your taxation and user charges, they deemed you be in a low risk uh, area financially. And you can see we're at 37%. So, this year was a good year financially for the uh, for the town. Um, this is just a summary of your debt, um, and it shows you 
the total amount of debt, what our long-term debt charges is, are, uh, what our, our total repayment limit uh, could be. Uh, we don't want to max out our credit card, so to speak, but it could be up to $4 million, but we're only paying three. And it gives you our long-term debt per household. Again, these are just little facts that you can look at, but I think all these all these numbers show that we're moving in the right direction. Um, certainly when you look at our municipal equity and our reserves, they are growing. I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, we do have a lot of assets in the town. Um, if I were to look at our tangible capital assets of what they, uh, what we've paid for them initially, we, I think, at cost, our assets are around worth about 150 million. And we've depreciated, you'd seen that third bullet under municipal equity. We've depreciated those uh, assets by around 50 million. And if you look down into the next category where it says financial indicators, you'll know in our, our fourth bullet, capital reserves to, accu to accumulated amortization is around 11%. So of that uh 50 million that we've taken in depreciation we have to replace assets over time um we've only got around in capital reserves around uh, 11 percent of that maybe somewhere in the five six million range so uh, although our reserves are higher they they are for particular purposes um but again our our, our debt charges we are paying back our our debt quickly uh, the province is concerned sometimes if it's greater than 5%. We've been greater than 5% for the last three or four years. Uh, but it is coming down as we pay, pay down our debt. And of course, we do count on money that we get from the government. You'll notice at the bottom of the page, uh, we kind of look at vulnerability. Uh, how much of our revenue comes from the government? Well, just for our operations, we get about 13%, largely from the provincial government. And if we counted our capital programs, it's up around 16 and a half. I mean, overall, uh, I mean, the the audit was largely done remotely. Maybe you want to comment on that, Serena, as to how the con uh, audit was conducted. Uh, but certainly we got great cooperation from the staff, from Jennifer and Estelle and, and their staff. And uh, maybe uh, you have some comments Serena. Uh, well, the audit was done a uh, uh, combination of at the town hall and remotely. So I think a good job with um, everybody, you know, everybody, uh, you know, this year is trying to be careful with COVID and make sure <clears throat> everybody's being safe. So um, I think we found a happy balance with it. We went in for a couple of days and then, uh, and then finished the rest of the audit back at the office. So I guess um, we're happy to try and answer any questions. If I can't answer them, I'm sure Serena can. And if she can't, I'm sure Jennifer can. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from council? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Howard, I noticed that the low risk, with, the low, with us being um, evaluated as a low risk, do you think the province will then say, oh, if there's no risk to those guys, we won't give them money where there's a high risk, these guys got to get out of debt? Is it, you know? Well, that's always a concern, I guess. Uh, but really, certainly through COVID, um, they've been generous, you know, with new grant programs, startup grants and, and that kind of thing. I don't know. I think politically, um, it's very difficult for them just to cut back on our financing because uh, th there would be real implications to our uh, to our taxpayers. So I'm hopeful that they won't do that. I mean, I think there's been good representation from, uh, um, you know, the the Ontario municipalities, the OMA, and I, I think there has been uh, good representation. So I'm hopeful that that won't happen. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? No, a couple comments. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I got to tell you, I was the one that was a little bit paranoid a year ago over what would happen to our tax arrears over the last 18 months with the COVID thing and the and the threat of job loss and and you know 
layoffs and things like that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly pleased uh, with that. I'm not as optimistic again as Howard about what will happen in the future. Our governments have some huge debt after the last two years with, uh, with COVID. So, you know, uh, they, you're, I agree they can't dry it up, but I think it's going to be a, a pretty slim uh, Tekken's kind of season for a year or two until they get that deficit under control. So uh, thanks uh, very much, Howard and Serena. And Jennifer, thanks to you and your team. Another great year. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we have a delegation now, the ATV Club, who's introducing yeah. them. I think, Maureen, are you going to introduce? I, I'm going to put them in. I think I have everyone, so just bear with me, Mr. Mayor. I think she okay, just... Sure said to me that um, she's got multiple computers. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. So Teresa, if you can hear me, I, I don't know if you need me to pull anybody else in. Uh, no, if you could just uh, confirm if you can hear me on audio is fine or not. It's been a challenging tech day, so. Yes, we can hear you. And Teresa is the president of the uh, Renfrew County ATV Club. And I believe she also wants to introduce Cameron, who is a new director for Armprior. Um, but I let you do that, Teresa. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, Mayor Stack and members of council, uh, County Councillor Lynch and staff, thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to come before you. Um, as mentioned, I'm the president for Renfrew County ATV Club, and I've also asked uh, to join me this evening uh, Cameron Han, who is the new director for the Arm Prior and McNabb Brayside area on the board of directors for Renfrew County. Um, so this evening, our focus really is to introduce you to Renfrew County ATV Club. We've done delegations with most of our towns and municipalities. We have not uh, yet had the opportunity to come before you. And so it was an opportunity to, to do so, to let you know a little bit more about uh, where we're heading and what we're doing within your community and to come forward with uh, a request for your support with a land use agreement so we can continue to increase the tel trail tourism and economic development in our prior. And then um, uh, lastly, just so that you're, uh, I'm here if you have questions about the trails that uh, go in and around our prior McNabb Brayside, we can certainly answer some of those questions for you as well. So, um, so in this evening's uh, presentation, I will, like I said, introduce you to RCATV. I'd like to give a bit of a nod to Regulation 316.03, which is the new uh, regulation in Ontario to, to keep Ontario moving. And then we can talk a little bit um, briefly towards the end about a land use agreement and, and the partnership that we're looking for from Renfrew County ATV Club. If you wouldn't mind, Kayla, thank you for moving me through. So I think what's important to understand about Renfrew County ATV Club is that we very much uh, see ourselves as a member of our greater community. So that means that we are, um, you know, just one of, uh, I guess, six other areas of people that it really takes in order to make trail tourism uh, a strong economic um, position within Renfrew County. It certainly requires the support of our trail users. It certainly, uh, as well as our riders, and I make that distinction because we have multi-use trail systems, and so our trail users are not always motorized and not always members of Renfrew County ATV Club. We certainly have a st very strong component, very vibrant uh, volunteer base. We are entirely um, volunteer managed and operated, uh, with the exception of some students that we've, uh, we try to employ throughout our summer months. And it also in involves uh, partnerships with our landowners, like yourselves as a municipality, but also for our, our uh, businesses and the industry itself. So we are members of the Ontario Federation of ATB Clubs, which is the provincial body here in the province of Ontario. It represents 21 clubs with over 12,000 annual members. And we have reciprocal agreements with a number of other provincial riding federations, including an agreement with the province of Quebec that will help encourage trail tourism from our Quebec riders to come into Ontario and vice versa. For Renfrew County ATV Club, we're currently, as a, as a group of volunteers, managing and maintaining 1,200 plus kilometers of trails, which represents almost uh, actually just over half of the entire trail systems in Ontario. We are also a member of the Ontario Trails Council. We're governed by a board of 17, so we have a very strong volunteer board, 17 strong, and we've been incorporated as a not-for-profit since 2007. 
Would you mind, Kayla, moving us? So we've seen some significant growth in the ATV industry. I'm sure you're seeing the same thing, uh, but but just as a bit of a glimpse from an RCTV perspective, uh, I work in the federal government in the data realm. And so for me, data talks. And so uh, so in our case, when uh, a group of us got involved with Renfrew County ATV Club and looked to do some rebranding and growing, we had 20 annual members. And now in 2021, we're already um, ready to surpass 2000 members. Whereas last year at the end of the year, we had 1,100 members. So we're seeing significant growth. And our growth comes not just from those living within Renfrew County. We attract riders from all over Ontario and even outside of our provincial borders who are members and pay for a membership uh, with a trail permit from Renfrew County ATV Club. And we'd like to think that that's because we are very progressive. We try to keep our riders and our landowners top of mind and we invest our funds. We are a not-for-profit and they see the benefit and the value that we bring back to the trail and trail users uh, regularly. So as far as our priorities, our priorities in this year, 2021, sadly another year where we're not running large events. And so we're focusing our efforts on rider safety, both with uh, train, rider training programs for ATV and side-by-side, -side, uh, um, building our trail warden program, as well as looking at signage and hazard identification. We continue to focus on trail safety, which means investing in our trails, uh, implementing a trail management strategy in urban areas, looking at reduced speed zones and instituting a trails report actually as an initiative with um, MyFM. For rider engagement, uh, it means uh, marketing and outreach and how to stay connected to our riders and responding to our riders, even in a year of COVID, a second year with diminished uh, events, but a growing ridership. So we look for ways to try to encourage and keep the conversations going about rider etiquette, safe riding practices and the like. So just a glimpse of some of the things that you can count on Renfrew County ATV Club to be doing. The first one is to promote and address trail safety. So whether that means actual work on our trail system, if it means um, trying to enforce trail etiquette, we've instituted on our trail uh, system, uh, the only one in the Federation who has a technicality rating, much like a ski hill, to try to keep our riders, if they are new riders uh, to ATV riding or side-by-side -side riding, to be able to let them know where they should and should not be starting their day out. If they are not looking to be winching themselves, then they should be staying on a green trail. So these are just some of the measures that we've taken in place to try to promote and address trail safety. On the next slide, um, we also uh, spend a significant amount of effort uh, on education for both rider safety and trail etiquette. And so if you wouldn't mind, Kayla, Yep, so we do have uh, ATV certified instructors that help uh, provide ATV training for youth and adults, both on ATVs and side-by-sides. We fully recognize that we are a multi-use organization. And so we recognize the value that that brings to the community, but it also means that we recognize our role and responsibilities on a multi-use trail system. And we work very closely, in fact, uh, we're at texting level with our uh, OPP save team constables um, out of Eastern Ontario, as well as our local OPP, wherever there are, we need their support to help address uh, behaviors, uh, trouble areas, speed, et cetera. And I think one example of that would be the email that I recently sent uh, just before the weekend um, on uh, the outcome of having the OPP save team and our chief trail warden and warden patrol out in Renfrew to arm prior area. Uh, where we had a number of um, infractions that were addressed, uh, youth on the trail, excessive speed, uh, youth encounters, uh, incidents of no insurance, helmet infractions, seatbelt infractions, and the like. So we continue to do these uh, both on our, on our own patrolling as uh, RCTV wardens, but we also, um, where they are available, we include the OPP safe team to partner with us so that they can be the enforcement arm of... Um, uh, of our warden program. It's important to note that our uh, warden program, um, I guess I'll, it does speak to it in a little bit, but our warden program is very much first and foremost, an opportunity to be present on the trails and to encourage proper writing etiquette. We also do a fair amount to support our landowners. So besides the insurance that we provide, uh, we continue to work with our landowners and municipalities to address trail hazards and concerns. And in 2020, we invested 
0.87% of our revenue went right back into trails. Um, so trails is our predominant um, expense and so it should be. Um, and then we also collaborate with other trail user groups uh, with regards to the Algonquin Trail going through uh, our prior, we partner with the rest of the um, Renfrew County Trail Associations. So ATV, snowmobile, cyclists, walking, et cetera, to work together with the county to address common issues. And then lastly, we very much are a champion for trail tourism. We partner with the OVTA. We are a member of the OVTA. We have an ovation for service excellence. Uh, we also partner with the Ontario Highlands Tourism Organization and a number of our, uh, not only media, but our car corporate and trail tourism partners as well. So our accommodations, restaurants, uh, gas stations and the like. So on the next slide, I'd um, like to start to talk to you a little bit about the about how we are addressing um, neighbor concerns. And so if you wouldn't mind, Kayla, um, to our next slide. So there's two major concerns that we hear from residents who live alongside of a trail, one being speed, and the second one being sound, um, and we also address dust issues. So I wanted to provide a little bit of fact um, to try to help. Uh, these are statistics that we've um, been getting from the industry themselves so that we could address uh, factually as much as we could some of the concerns that uh, residents will often bring forward or the questions we may get from municipal members uh, and members of council. So when it comes to speeds, the, the legislation at the uh, Health Highway Traffic Act for off-road vehicles indicates that on roads that are 20 kilometers, it, um, 50 kilometers or under in speed, an ATV or an off-road vehicle can only ride 20 kilometers. So in town, if it's a 50 kilometer or below posted speed, then an ATV side-by-side -side should be going no greater than 20 kilometers where the, the road posted speed is over 50 kilometers, so perhaps in an 80 kilometer zone, an ATV or an off-road vehicle should only be going 50 kilometers an hour. So that's on roads and that's legislated. When it comes to trails, it's as posted in accordance with the bylaw. So in the case of the Algonquin Trail in rural, We lost her. We lost your, oh. Lost video, Mr. Mayor. Just no give me audio. One second, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to have to stop this share and come see if I can put her back in. She might have got dropped off. Just give me one second. Teresa, are you there? There we go. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, I am. Yeah. But I think I lost Kayla? Colin. Okay. Yes, I can hear you, but I think I lost Colin. Cameron? Okay, perfect. Cameron, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so he'll be able to hear, perhaps. He just may not be able to, uh, to participate. That's okay. No problem. There you go. Perfect. Great. So I apologize for that, uh, such as our rural community. <laughs> so I was addressing neighborhood concerns and uh, just letting you know a little bit about uh, speed in particular. Um, the OPP can enforce both on a trail as long as it has a bylaw with, um, with indications as to what it is they're enforcing, as well as, of course, on roads. Um, ATVs ride very differently than snowmobiles. Uh, we share oftentimes the same kilometer per hour and the same speed limits, but uh, riding an ATV is um, generally, for those who do not have an ATV, generally much uh, slower as riders, uh, given the terrain. We, we don't have a nice, uh, nice smooth snow surface to ride on, and so oftentimes the very nature of ATVing is such that it's a bit slower. In regards to sound, um, so the statistics from the industry is that uh, 95 uh, decibels over an eight hour period are what's considered harmful. And I've just provided you with a bit of an indication as to where ATVs generally um, fit along with some of the other um, perhaps noises that you may hear in a community. So if you could go to our next slide, please, for me. 
So specifically on the Algonquin Trail, uh, RCATV's investment for 2021 on the Algonquin Trail, uh, we have $30,000 budgeted for grading. So we do the grading that our grader has been donated by the county for the purchase price of a dollar. And in exchange, we grade the trails as, as a volunteer team. And so we grade uh, not only our trails, but we also grade the Algonquin Trail. We'll be uh, continuing to support the county with gating, uh, we've already this year removed two tons of metal and will continue to do so. This year we'll be installing Algonquin Trail signage, so that will become particularly helpful in our prior area where Lanark County has a different um, opening date than the rest of Ontario for, for some reason, and we're working with the county to hopefully address that. But uh, the signage that we'll be putting out on the trail to support the county will indicate uh, ATVs and from what month to what month, which hopefully will help not only the OPP be able to enforce, but it'll also help um, maybe uh, raise awareness of riders. If we could go to the next slide, please, for me. So a few other uh, pieces that you may or may not uh, be aware of when it comes to the Algonquin Trail. So we do have a bylaw we do have a lease agreement with the county. Uh, the bylaw on the Algonquin Trail states May 1st to November 30th, and the hours of use are from 7 till 11. And RCTV and riders both uh, look to work with the municipality and residents so that we can find continue to find solutions when it comes to uh, urban areas. As far as trail etiquette, um, we do a significant amount to try to increase trail etiquette. We work closely with our non-motorized um, rider federations and groups to look for ways where we can work together. So if that means they're doing an event that they would like ATVs to be aware of, we let our ATVs know there's an increased, uh, maybe a run or a marathon and vice versa. We also focus on our rider safety and I've indicated already in a few places, some of those uh, areas where we're trying to focus on rider safety. Our warden program, uh, I alluded to briefly, was uh, it, we are there for primarily for ambassadorship. We can do permit enforcement on our trails where a permit is required. Currently on the Algonquin Trail, there is no permit required. So currently on the Algonquin Trail, our, um, our presence or our activities are limited to providing a presence, uh, trying to uh, encourage um, multi-use trail etiquette, uh, proper behavior, answer questions of residents, but we are unable to enforce um, the bylaws. We are not a designated by, we do not have designated bylaw officer status. Uh, we've been trying to move in that direction, but as of yet, do not yet. And uh, we also, of course, do not enforce a permit on the Algonquin Trail because it is not permit, uh, not permit required. It is a public trail. Um, I'd like to take a, qu a quick slide and just uh, touch on the Ontario Regulation 316. Uh, and so if you're unaware, this is the regulation that came into effect in uh, this uh, past January. And it essentially expands the definition of off-road vehicle to include what they call extreme off-road vehicles. So that would be dirt bikes, as well as Argo, so six-wheeled vehicles. Currently, um, the, the uh, Ontario Regulation states that if there is no bylaw in a location in one of the um, scheduled municipalities, th which for the most part are municipalities where the majority of their roads are greater than 80 kilometers an hour, uh, then that municipality, so if I use the example of McNabb Brayside, then that municipality, if they did not have a bylaw to prohibit these vehicles, they would by default be allowed. This is a change from the way the legislation was prior, which said there vehicles were prohibited unless there was a bylaw that allowed. The only reason I bring this up to you is to make sure that council is aware that or and staff are aware the definition has changed. And so in your bylaws, if you're referring specifically in your bylaws um, that grant ATV access on certain roads uh, or prohibit them on others, and it only speaks to the definition related in the legislation, there may need to be a change just so that it either, if you do want it to rate, maintain just ATV side by side, you may have to address that. Uh, whereas the definition uh, now has been expanded to include dirt bikes and uh, Argo. So I just put that out there. Um, it may be, there may be some ambiguity in bylaws as they start to kind of be redone to reflect the new um, definitions. So if I could uh, move on to 
the last piece of this um, conversation, which is a land use agreement. And uh, in particular, what we're coming to you for, if you wouldn't mind moving us to the next slide, is that uh, we currently are um, provide the copy of the bylaws and try to educate on our riders on where they can and cannot ride. It is ideally up to each rider and their responsibility to know where they ride and to know if they've moved from Lanark County to Renfrew County or from Armprior to McNabb Brayside, etc. However, one of the things we're coming to this evening is in regards to a new trail route that we would like to designate on our maps to try to help riders come off of the Algonquin Trail and to be able to access um, restaurants, uh, fuel, accommodations, et cetera, in the town of Armprior. At present, uh, for those riders who are traveling on the Algonquin Trail, they bypass Armprior for the most part and uh, are not able to get to all areas of Armprior, nor are they uh, the residents in certain areas of Armprior able to get to the trails. Um, so what we're asking a uh, partnership with, with the town of Armprior is your support with um, obtaining a land use agreement with OPG, with Ontario Power, for um, the end of DaCosta Street so that we could designate DaCosta Street as a way for for riders to come off of the trail to be able to access fuel and uh, accommodations and restaurants um, off of um, Madawaska Boulevard and uh, a little bit easier. Right now, we're well aware that local riders know how to get on and off the trail and make use of that bush uh, for recreational riding. However, they are technically trespassing. It is not, it is private land owned by OPG. So what we're trying to do is to address a, a better route and a formalized route so that riders can get off of the trail, access to Costa Street and head over for to, to access the accommodations. It does not require a change to the county bylaws. The, this section of Madawaska Boulevard would be in line with the county bylaws currently as to where ATVs are allowed. And it also would be within, um, you know, it's not uh, prohibited currently for ATVs to ride on. However, as you're, I'm sure, aware, at the end of DeCosta Street is private land. It does not connect directly to the trail from the street. Uh, we're aware that the town has, or I believe the county, one or the other does have a snow dump on that property. Um, we have started uh, a conversation with OPG by sending an email to indicate our interest, but we have not yet heard back. And so we're looking for the town to, town support to try to provide another avenue for that trail tourism and for your residents in that area of Armprior to be able to access the trail. So uh, uh, Mayor Stack and uh, council members, that concludes the information that we wanted to share with you and the support that we're looking for. Um, uh, we are certainly available to answer your questions whether it's related to the existing trail, the Algonquin Trail and the role that Renfrew County ATV Club plays within the community and uh, the greater community, or if it's uh, more specifically related to our hope to be able to add the DeCosta Street as an ATV route to be able to encourage riders to come off the trail and um, provide some greater economic benefit to the town of Armprior. So I'll pass this back to you, Mayor, for any questions or discussion. Thank you. Any comments or questions from anyone? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Totally in favor of this agreement to for the OPG. The only issue is that once they come off the Algonquin Trail and go down the hill and make a right to get to DaCosta, they're not following that route. They're continuing straight down the private properties behind uh, uh, along the old trail train tracks of the CN and go to a mud pit where we get all kinds of complaints from the people from Mo Robillard. If the yes, if the four wheelers would only stick to where they're supposed to be, there'd be no issues. And that to me would, you'd have to fence it to keep those people from doing that. Um, it's gonna be an expense. Thank you. Anyone else? Lynn? Also, um, the one thing that, because I live out across the bridge, the one thing that I want to be certain of, I, I do appreciate that anybody out across the bridge 
would love a way to get onto the trails um, and vice versa for people coming off to get fuel or food or whatnot. But I think it needs to be reminded to, um, that they're not allowed across the bridge. They're not allowed to travel on the bridge to get into town. So anybody that wants things on this side of town need to get off that trail on this side of town, as opposed to getting off there and traveling across the bridge and, and through our downtown core. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I have a, a couple comments just because, uh, uh, you know, I've, up until recently, I've, uh, I've been a, an ATV owner and user and I sat eight years on the committee at the county that, uh, that uh, developed the trail uh, and certainly a supporter of the trail. We have a number of complaints as, as Councillor Lynch mentioned from across the bridge. And I've been dealing with OPG, both I think as in Mr. Dick and Mr. Malvihill. Uh, and interesting enough, last Friday morning, I met them with a local businessman out there and we walked that area and they uh, are, I would say certainly supportive at this time about talking to the town and the ATV club about uh, a solution there. Uh, the, I think the route that seems uh, most obvious to most people, OPG wasn't as anxious about crossing the, the snow dump area and coming out there and they have some reasons for that. But I think there is a good opportunity for discussion. I only knew by agenda that, uh, you know, that this presentation was happening tonight so I made them aware of that and said that maybe after this meeting uh, between the club and the town, we could join with them and have another discussion about it. Uh, they are in the process of putting up some uh, significant signage through that whole area in terms of private property signs on uh, both the, uh, the north and south side of the trail as it crosses uh, the trussle uh, to the far side onto their property because they're concerned as you cross to the right or the south side, there's a number of ATVs have gone down towards the water there. So they're concerned about uh, that from their own perspective. They're gonna put uh, the signage up that's been requested uh, through that area. It's very wet back in some of that areas. And it's obvious to where, uh, where uh, I'm drawing some conclusions here, being an old gray-haired gray -haired ATV or the younger users are out there <laughs> and they get into that swampy area and they're mudding. So what they're doing, they're ripping around and that's what's causing the complaint. And being out there last Friday morning, you can see how it's all tore up. And, and I know enough about the machines to know that that's what's been going, going through those mud holes, you know? So I think there's, <laughs> there's a solution there, but uh, uh, I think the next step would be to have some kind of discussion jointly with OPG because they have some specific, uh, ideas about how they would like to do it. Mr. Dick, who is the, he's the manager of the auto or the Madawaska River group. So it controls the dams along the Madawaska. And uh, he has some, uh, some preference. He said that he was not opposed to considering access in a trail, but he had some uh, concerns and he would like to really have that discussion with uh, both the town and the club. So I think that's kind of a next step uh, process there. And it was gonna take, you know, what their suggestion is, and it makes sense if you're out there physically to see it, it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take culvert uh, in there and a bit of work around there. And I know that's not unknown to the ATV club, but uh, I think there's some real potential to find a solution there. And I would think a meeting, a joint meeting would be the best way to go as soon as uh, we could arrange such a thing. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so if I may, um, through, through yourself, just to respond. Uh, so we have contacted and been in conversation with the Snowmobile Club because, of course, the Snowmobile Club do have a number of trails off of that. And the, we certainly, the ATV Club, is not interested in using the spur closest to residents. Um, I know the Snowmobile Club does use that trail, and I'm aware that the local riders, uh, local um, residents use those that trail in the bush what we're hoping to do is provide a a formal uh trail away from that area so that at least the tourism the ones who don't live in the local area 
have a proper way to access it versus just um, you know trespassing because they see a dirt trail. Uh, the snowmobile club also, of course, crosses the dam and heads uh, uh, over the highway that way. And we have no interest in having ATVers anywhere near that dam either. So we're looking for the we have the ability to ride on a road, and we're looking for that simplest, safest um, route. And we greatly would appreciate that partnership. Yeah, and that's, and I think OPG is, they're not interested in ATVs on the dam either. No. And they did say they even shut the dam to the snowmobiles for one season because of, of some concerns they had there, but they're, they have reopened it to them the last couple uh, seasons. I think, you know, just walking through it with them, I think there's a, a, a compromising option in, in, the, in the layout there that, that will work and they're that's, you know, the position they're taking is, is the direction of it. So I'm sure they'll be happy to, to walk that through with you. Wonderful. We also, um, to your point, uh, Councillor uh, Grinstead, we also uh, mentioned to the county that we would put up signage at our cost before the bridge to indicate, because they currently don't have any signage on the bridge that indicates ATV not allowed as they hit that bridge. And so we would take that cost on. If we're going to be encouraging riders coming off of uh, De Costa Street, we would make sure that riders are aware. Because again, if they're coming from Kingston, they won't know what the bylaws are in our prior. And so we will um, put at our cost a no ATVs uh, in advance of that bridge so that they're aware. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one other comment that OPG made was that, you know, not that they wouldn't consider fencing, but that's a very expensive option for them. And they're not at that point now to kind of uh, uh, fence off certain sections of it. So even if there's a solution, I think there's going to be some education and some patrolling and some policing still required in that area. Yes. Okay. So, uh, I don't know from this on, maybe I could suggest that uh, that staff take it up with you again and uh, Teresa and uh, we could structure a, a discussion, a meeting and maybe get OPP, OPG to join and uh, we can get clarification from you on your land use agreement. Thank you very much. Okay, if that's all right by council, we'll, we'll get uh, Tom, yeah. Worship, uh, I'm having problems with the word out of the computer. It's all garbled on that. Yeah, it is for you too, Tom. No audio. I don't know. I, I have no, I don't know what's going on. Okay, I don't know, Tom, if you would be able to come back in. I can let you back in. I mean, I can can you hear Kayla, Tom? Can you hear me, Tom? I can hear you and I can hear the mayor, but the presentations I could not hear. I could not hear Councillor Grinsad speak and I couldn't hear the mayor speak. It was all garbled. Okay, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, let me know if it changes again and then we can let you back, like ask us you to come back in and out. But if like if it gets like that again, maybe with just your internet connection. Okay, let me, Tom, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, Your Worship. Okay, so what, what I was suggesting is that we uh, oh, defer it to... Terrible again, sir. Hmm. I don't Can't know. make it. Okay, I was suggesting that staff would... Call. No, he can't. he can't hear me, so he's making a sign. Mr. Mayor, is it possible for Kayla to cut him off and then ask him to reboot? I don't I know if you can hear it. that. I'm going to give him a call. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Is it okay for me to let Teresa go then, Mr. Mayor? Or you yes. Thanks, to Teresa. Okay. Perfect. Have a great night, Teresa. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Tom, if you can hear me, I think Maureen is trying to give you a call. Okay, thank you. Just left, so it's probably going to the phone. <clears throat> Hello. 
I don't know, Robin, if uh, if I can ask, I, I feel it is the internet connection because that does happen to me every time my internet goes off, it gets garbly. So I don't know if jumping back in and out is going to necessarily help. I'm not sure. Do you want to uh, continue with the agenda for now? I'm just wondering if yeah, exactly what was going through my mind, if that's okay. But yeah. the next report is the one that you are uh, stepping yeah. away for. So he has to lead it. And yeah, we need him. Yeah, that's right. I was just going to say that there's uh, no, no, no public meetings or matters table. So we're back up to the first staff report. We can move ahead on that list, maybe if that's. But maybe oh, he's back. Let's see what's. He's, he's going to try to log out and then we'll try to bring him back in. Okay. We'll give him a few minutes. I think he could probably go ahead and we'll just. He, need, put but he needs to lead the next we report. We need him for the next. Uh... Oh, I see. Gotcha. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you wanted to jump the agenda and then go to the, back to that one. That would be your choice, Maureen and Mr. Mayor. Uh, didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. We can hear you now. Can you hear us? You didn't leave the I'm meeting. Working. No, he didn't leave. <laughs> but you didn't leave the meeting, Tom. So you need to leave leave the meeting and come back in, is what they're saying. And see if it resets it. I'm not a techie, but on the bottom right. Oh, oh there we go. Oh. There he's out now. Mm -hmm. Or you could uh, you could go to the next deputy mayor if you'd like, <laughs> which is Councillor yeah, Toner. I just thought if he was, is he going to try to come back in right he's away? Gonna try, he's going to try to come back in, but Councillor Toner could get his feet wet. He starts up on July first, I believe. So I think it's. Oh. <laughs> There's a test. We'll put him in the quicksand now. Is he? Is he technically deputy mayor then? Is that how it just he, he, yeah, he, I mean you can you can appoint anyone as deputy mayor at this point yeah. with yeah. Councillor Burnett not here, but uh, okay, let's do that. And uh Chris will appoint you as deputy mayor to handle that first uh it's got his <laughs> thumb up good. He's ready to go. Yep, first All staff right. report please. All right, now we'll uh, we'll move to staff reports. And uh, the first one is 89 John Street North encroachment. I believe uh, Megan, this is this is your yep. presentation. So the council receives report 2105 2501 89 John Street North encroachment, and the council adopted a bylaw permitting the encroachment to a maximum of four inches feet. Sorry, into the John Street Municipal Road allowance as per the application submitted. And with that, Mr. Deputy Mayor will need a mover and a seconder. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Dan and Lynn? All in favor? Wait. No. Megan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. And then Megan. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so in conjunction with the construction of the eight unit apartment building at 89 John Street North, the owner included in their site plan, which was approved by council, four awnings above the windows on the second floor of the building. So the awnings actually encroach approximately four inches onto the town's road allowance. And as such, the property owners require permission from the municipality uh, to support that encroachment. So the property owners have applied, uh, submitted an application for the four, four inches and have also provided staff with their general liability insurance, uh, which is required to support an encroachment. So should council be in support of the encroachment, I've said encroachment a lot in the last few sentences, a uh, bylaw has been prepared for council's consideration this evening. All right, do we have any discussion? Yes, County Councillor Lynch. Megan, how high does the encroachment in height? So if I have a six story building and I have an awning on the sixth floor and you look up on four inches out, does that mean they're encroaching on our 
our uh, land, like, so we go 25 miles up, it's still part of this four inches. Just curious. Yes, that is correct. Huh? Yes. So well, it's, it's as if you were like a bird's eye view down on the edge of the road allowance, the awnings encroach four inches over the property line. Right. Thank you. Hmm. Anybody else have any questions or concerns? All right. All in favor? Uh... We need an all in favor, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, well then let's, uh, can I have an all in favor, please? All right, it's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Look at that. Uh, so the next one is proposed changes to the land division uh, provisions. Hale. The council receives report 2105-1002, sorry, 2502, and the council direct staff to submit a copy of this report to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to serve as formal comments on the proposed changes to land division provisions in the Planning Act. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Lisa, Megan is up again. Yes. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on April 15th of this year, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing posted changes to certain land division provisions in the Planning Act. So these changes impact plans of subdivision as well as consent applications. So a number of amendments are proposed, which I included in the planning report before council this evening. And the ministry is seeking feedback from municipalities on these proposed changes. Many of the changes that I have highlighted uh, will have little impact on the day-to-day -day operations in the planning department because they're practices or changes that the town has previously adopted, but some will, in, uh, some will involve new applications being created and additional resources. So two amendments that are proposed that the town is already uh, working with are that applicants are permitted to make amendments to their consent application or severance application up until a decision has been made by the committee of adjustment. And that is something that town staff have always uh, permitted an applicant to do and is quite reasonable. Uh, another change would allow a potential purchaser to be able to submit an application for consent on behalf of the property owner if they are intending to purchase this. And the town has always in their consent application had uh, a space where you can authorize an agent to act on behalf of the property owner. So this isn't really a, a large change at all to the way that the town's practices work for consent applications. Many of the other amendments that are proposed in the Planning Act have been brought about as recommendations from planning staff over the years, as well as from real estate lawyers who work quite closely with the Planning Act in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, two changes that I would like to highlight for council uh, understanding are that the new provisions would allow an extension for the fulfillment of consent applications. So currently the Planning Act outlines that applicants have one year to fulfill conditions of consent and the changes would allow that the Committee of Adjustment could extend the time provisions for an additional year. The second change that I would highlight is the Certificate of Cancellation. So currently uh, there's a, a common saying that planners and real estate lawyers use, once a consent, always a consent. Uh, that would no longer be applicable. There is uh, what's being proposed is a certificate of cancellation, which would allow a property owner to come forward to the municipality and apply to cancel the consent, which wouldn't actually cancel the lot creation, but would instead cancel uh, that the lot was created via consent. So similar to a deeming bylaw for a plan of subdivision, but there was no mechanism previously for consent applications. You'll note in the comments as well uh, that there are some recommendations that staff has put forward as the ministry is updating both the Planning Act and then subsequent changes to the regulations uh, that enforce and uh, have additional details. Uh, for the legislation, so planning staff are recommending that the plan of subdivision Ontario regulation also be updated to reflect more recent changes that have occurred to the Planning Act, such as the fact that members of the public are no longer permitted to appeal plans of subdivision, but the wording that planning staff are required to put on notices uh, still states 
that uh, members of the public can appeal. So changes like that will better the process and the understanding for members of the public. And also requesting that the ministry provide new guidance documents or update existing guidance documents as planning staff use those as resources to share with applicants, especially when they're going through the planning approval process for the first time. It's very beneficial for them to be able to see these guidance documents and understand the planning act and the regulations that are in place. But in many cases, these documents haven't been updated since the early 2000s. And with these more recent changes will be quite out of date. So recommending that the ministry take the opportunity with these changes to update all of the guidance documents uh, so that they're better resources for members of the public. Be happy to answer any questions that council may have or go into more detail on some of the other proposed amendments. Comments, questions, Ted? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Megan, the extension of the uh, time limit for, I guess it's to provide the certificate uh, to be extended one year. One year from what date? From the date of the committee decision? Any adjustment? So yes, generally uh, that would be the date. So it's typically the date that the notice is issued is the date of the consent, which has to be uh, prepared and circulated within 15 days of the committee of adjustment making a decision. So approximately the date that the committee makes that decision, yes. So to, to get this extension, what's involved? To get the extension, the applicant would need to apply to the municipality for an additional one year extension. And as the provisions are worded right now, the proposed provisions, the application would go to the committee of adjustment who could then grant or not grant an extension to the, the time to fulfill conditions. And the way it's worded now, the committee would have the discretion for the time to approve. So it can be up to one year, but could be less than that. And with the provisions as they're worded now as well, there's no appeal mechanism. So if the committee of adjustment did not support an extension to fulfill conditions, the decision would lapse on the one day period, or sorry, after the one year period, if no extension was permitted by the committee. And does, does that require a new application fee to the committee? That would be planning staff's recommendation. Uh, at this time, I don't foresee many applicants seeking an extension. So this is something that I'd recommend that council consider as part of the update to the user fees and charges bylaw next year, as most applicants who I deal with are very eager to move forward with their severance application and almost have their survey done before their appeal period has even ended. Uh, and we can formally even issue a certificate of official. So I don't foresee that being much additional work for staff, but I would like to create a new application and then at the update to the user fees and charges bylaw next year, propose a fee for council's consideration. So this process, if approved, would eliminate the hazard of properties merging in the event of uh, different ownership or things falling into same ownership? So that is a, a separate change that is proposed under the Planning Act. Now, it would only be applicable to the retained land, which is what's newly proposed as well, that the retained lands uh, would have the same provisions under the Planning Act in terms of being able to be conveyed as consented lands do, which are the, the typically the severed lands of an application. There are also provisions proposed for joint tenants. So currently under the Planning Act, as you mentioned, if two pieces of land are under the same ownership, they merge on title and are essentially treated as one piece of land, unless one was created by consent or their lots within a plane of subdivision. Uh, so in many cases, such as Arn Prior, there are many historic plans of subdivision, but there are still instances where lots have not been created by consent or were not created by a plan of subdivision. And as such, once they're under common ownership, they would be merged and treated as one lot. What's proposed with these provisions would be the fact if one lot, and typically I'm going to use a husband and wife scenario, if one lot was uh, owned by the wife, so Mrs., and the other lot was under the name of Mr. and Mrs., 
what was happening is that if the Mrs. passed away and then both lots were under the name of the Mr., they'd then merge on title and be considered one lot. And this was quite common across Eastern Ontario and where I came from in Frontenac, we did see it, uh, where many people had chosen to purchase the neighboring cottage lot beside them to extend their property. Or sometimes you see at the end of a plan of subdivision, someone purchases an additional lot to have more land. So the provisions that are proposed would ensure that if the properties were under joint tenants, and then one of the joint tenants passed away, the land would not merge with the abutting lands if also under the same ownership. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Anyone else? No. Uh, just going back on Ted's question about the fees. So if, if they come in the, you know, for that extension, they're gonna pay the same fee as they would applying again. Is that the intent? And that's what you'd be recommending next year at the user fee review? I would most likely not be recommending that it be the same fee as the work associated with an extension to fulfill conditions. It's not as onerous as a new consent application coming in. So as far as I'm aware, under the way the amendments are worded right now, there's no circulation requirements for an extension to conditions where a consent application requires circulation to neighboring property owners, signage being posted on the property, as well as being posted in the newspaper, which all have costs associated with them. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know about anybody else. This was kind of a confusing process to read through and try to grasp. I met with Robin this morning and got some explanation on it, but I'm not, I'm just being honest. I'm not sure I'm a hundred percent and understanding the whole process again. So I may have questions for you, Megan, later. You know, I'm going to go through it one more time. <clears throat> Anybody else? No? Okay, so we need a, an all in favor then, please. Carried, thank you. And the next one is uh, Marshall's Bay Plan of Subdivision. Rename existing municipal road. I forgot to see Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor is rename existing municipal road. Gordon oh, I'm sorry, the renaming of the road. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the council, directs, the council directs staff to provide notice to advise of the intention to pass a bylaw for the renaming of a highway in accordance with the public notice policy ASCP 08 to rename Gordon Ferguson Place to Gordon Ferguson Place with two S's. Okay, move in seconder, please. Dan and Lynn. Megan's up again, and Megan, your your audio is gargled pretty badly. I don't know if we can do anything about it, but are we hearing that? Okay. Okay. I too am losing connection this evening, so let me know. And if it is bad, I can call in on my phone into the meeting. It'll just take me one second. I can hear you right now. We think you're okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so the next report before council speaks to the renaming of Gordon Ferguson Place. So council approves the use of the name Gordon Ferguson Place for the Callahan Farm Subdivision. And it's come to staff's attention that when the M plan was registered, my internet saying it's unstable right now. I don't know if you can still hear me. Uh, yeah. that there was um, a spelling error in the spelling of Ferguson. So there was only one S included in the last name instead of two. So to commemorate Gordon Ferguson, staff are recommending that the respelling or the correct spelling of the name be corrected on the sign. The public notice policy requires 30 days of notice to of intent to change the street name. So if council is in support of changing the street name, staff will work with the clerk's department to provide notice and we'll bring back a bylaw for council's consideration at a future meeting. For council's information, about half of the residents along Gordon Ferguson Place uh, used the two S's in their uh, municipal address, and the other half of the residents along Gordon Ferguson Place only have the one S in their, their civic address. Okay, comments, questions? No, all in favor then? I need at least four hands. I can't see them. One, two, two. Good. Thank you. 
And the next one then is uh, Marshall's Bay subdivision. Yes, the council's receiver report 2105-2504, Marshall's Bay Meadows plan of subdivision, lifting reserves and releasing site plan agreement. And that council adopt a bylaw to lift and dedicate 0.3 meter reserves being block 52 and 53 plan 49M108 as public highways and to lift the 0 .0, sorry, 0 0.3 meter reserves being block 51 and 54 plan 49M108 to be dedicated back to Marshall's Bay Regional Inc. And that council adopt a bylaw to authorize the release and deregistration of instrument number LT004690 being a 1999 site plan agreement entered into with 1101163 Ontario Inc. from the land subject to plan of subdivision 47T14002. Move. Move and seconder, please. Lynn, Chris, Megan again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this report has been prepared for uh, Council to understand the rationale between, for the two bylaws that are included on the agenda. Uh, so the first bylaw, as Kayla mentioned, is speaking to lifting the reserves, which will provide access from phase one into phase two. A previous bylaw had been prepared for Council's consideration. However, it lifted all four of the reserves and um, transferred them into the road for road purposes whereas two of the blocks had to be transferred back to Marshall's Bay Meadows to facilitate access of their lots uh, for phase two of the development. So the bylaw that's been prepared for council's consideration would repeal the previous bylaw and dedicate and transfer the reserves appropriately. Uh, second, as part of the renaming of the streets of Morgan Cloutier and Douglas Jim Brown Way in the Marshall's Bay Meadows Plain of Subdivision, it came to staff's attention that a 1999 commercial site plan agreement was registered on all of the lands subject to the Plain of Subdivision. It was never the intent that the site plan agreement be registered on these lands and staff aren't certain how that was done. Uh, perhaps the lands had previously merged and at the time of registration of phase one, it wasn't brought to staff or the solicitor's attention that the site plan agreement was registered on title. So as the site plan agreement is not applicable to the plan of subdivision lands, staff are recommending that council release and allow for the deregistration of the site plan agreement from the plan of subdivision lands. Uh, because as it is right now, this site plan is actually registered on each lot and block in phase one and would continue to be registered on the different lots and blocks as the plan of subdivision moves forward. So an acknowledgement and direction and bylaw have been prepared uh, for council's consideration to release or deregister the site plan agreement from the lands. Okay, comments or questions? I'm happy to answer any questions that council has. Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one thing on that site plan for Morgan Cluche, the sign is wrong in Marshall's, Marshall's Bay as of day. There's, you're missing the H in Cluche. Thank you. Any other comments? No, all in favor then? Good, thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> and the next one is uh, zoning bylaw housekeeping again, Kayla. The council received report 2105-2505 recommending provisions for fences and accessory buildings in the exterior side yard setback of townhouse units and the council directs staff to prepare amending bylaw to bring forward for council's consideration at a forthcoming meeting. Move and seconder, please. Chris and Lisa, Megan again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, staff were directed at the last council meeting to come back uh, to a future council meeting with provisions for fencing and accessory buildings in the exterior side yard setback. Uh, so the fence provisions have been modified from the previous provisions that were before council. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, so with respect to fencing, staff are recommending that the maximum height of fences in the residential zone along the front and exterior side yard setback be no greater than 1.9 meters in height, uh, which would provide adequate space for a six foot fence along the front and exterior side yard setback. Uh, and staff are also recommending the inclusion of the provision that was proposed by Councillor Toner, which speaks to fences being in good 
uh, construction manner, good repair and vertical and stable. Staff have removed the provisions that would require a setback from the property line as um, staff understand that there may be less interest from council in having a setback from the property line, but instead many of the public concerns that staff have heard speak to more of the height and the condition offenses as opposed to the location offenses once they are on private property. It's important to note that these provisions would only be applicable to residential lands and would only be applicable to the front and exterior side yard setback. So a property owner would be permitted to have a, a higher fence height in their rear yard or interior side yard. And then the second half of the report speaks to accessory buildings and permitting accessory buildings in the exterior side yard setback of the end units of townhouses uh, within the R4 zone. So staff are recommending that a, a section be added to the encroachment table that would permit accessory buildings in the exterior side yard setback. So the current provisions in the zoning bylaw for all exterior side yard setbacks is that the accessory buildings have the same setback requirements as the main building. So on the, the screen here is one of the images that were included in the staff report. Uh, so you can see that there is a 4.5 meter setback between the edge of street one, uh, which would be the edge of the road allowance, and the side of the building as part of the end townhouse unit. So currently, all accessory buildings would be required to be set back at least 4.5 meters from the exterior side yard setback. Uh, staff completed a review of accessory building locations and separations and spoke with both the building and public works staff in preparing this recommendation for council. The so staff are proposing an encroachment be added to the encroachment table that would permit an accessory building of up to 160 square feet in area to be permitted in the exterior side yard setback with a 1.2 meter setback from the edge of the lot line and then a 1.2 meter setback from the edge of the townhouse building itself. Uh, it's important to note with this scenario on the screen as well that this would recommend uh, this. Uh, proposes a minimum exterior side yard setback. In many cases, the exterior side yard setback is greater than 4.5 meters, which would allow for a larger shed or accessory building in this location. Staff are also recommending that should council support an accessory building in the exterior side yard setback, that the accessory building be limited to a single story in height. Uh, should council wish to reduce the setback less than the 1.2 meter setback, uh, to either the exterior side yard or to the edge of the dwelling. Council may wish to further limit the height of the building as even at a single story, the accessory building provisions allow for an accessory building to be up to five meters in height and on a, a slanted or angled roof that's measured to the midpoint of the peak. So it could be quite a high accessory building. Uh, and should council further wish to reduce the setback, they may also wish to reduce the maximum area that an accessory building could be if located within the exterior side yard setback. So less than the 160 square feet, for instance. Staff are recommending that these setbacks be uh, in place to ensure adequate space for access and maintenance of the buildings, as well as to ensure maintenance of green space and amenity space on these end units as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that council has and no bylaw has been prepared for this evening. Instead, staff are putting forward these recommendations and seeking comments from council before coming back with an amending bylaw. Okay, uh, just before we go ahead, Megan, you were really gargled for me. I, so I'm gonna be making some assumptions on the report I read and the comments I got from some other people, but I really couldn't follow your content tonight. You know, Any comments or questions? Lynn? I just, um, I know we're beating this to death, but I'm, uh, I'm a little, still a little concerned with the setbacks for the accessory building, especially um, I think for in between your dwelling and the building to set it back um, 1.2, so essentially four feet to, to me, not allowing them to put it closer or up against is actually going to create more of a trough for the water and the snow to, to form and, and to collect 
which could maybe cause damage to basement and drainage. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is that these lots aren't like the older lots like my mother would have or anything. You had all the room in the world to put things. These lots are smaller. And um, really, honestly, these people are spending good money on these homes. They're spending good money on tax dollars. Their lot is their lot. And I don't understand why we're telling them where they can put anything on their lot. So long as it's not obstructing the view. Now I do understand, you know, on an end unit where there's streets and you're coming to a corner, we have to make sure that people can safely get around and see around it. But regarding telling somebody where they can put a shed on their lot, I, I just don't feel comfortable with this. I, I feel that we're beating this to death. It's a little overkill. Um, so long as we're not obstructing the view, so we have put in place bylaws where corners and whatnot are not obstructed. Um, I think that people should have the right to put a shed up against their house if they wish, or a foot away from their house, or 10 feet away from their house if they have it. I, I don't I don't agree with telling them where they can and cannot put these. Um, and especially if there's a fence involved, if they have a fence, anything inside that fence, who are we to tell them where to put it? That's my two cents. Okay, anyone else? Dan, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I like the idea of having a separation between my storage building and my house in case there's a fuel or whatever, there's a fire, then there's a, it's going to be contained in that particular building, not going into my house. The second part was uh, where it only said one story. I'm thinking uh, people have those, I'll say, play structure where they get to build their little house in the bottom and they take a set of stairs up and they have their, their bedroom for their kid that they sleep, well, sleepovers, whatever, but their little uh, a miniature townhouse for children. So I'm concerned that the kids wouldn't be able to have their play structure in the back with being limited to only one story. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Ted? Yeah. I'm not comfortable with these restrictions. I don't have the answer right now. I agree with a lot of the points that Lynn has made. And uh, I think we gotta take a second look at this. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I've got a couple of comments because I, as you know, from two weeks ago, I've been dealing specifically with three examples in town on this issue. And, uh, you know, uh, already today I got emails saying that if we go forward with this, how do they apply for exceptions? And I see us going down that road and it's gonna consume more staff and I don't see value in this. I, uh, again, I, I concur with the fact that, you know, uh, people are, we decided as a council what the size of lots would be in this town. Townhouses, in the, you know, in the, uh, single family homes, side by side bungalows, whatever. We made those decisions. So we own the size of the, of the properties that are left. And then we turn around to people who are paying huge taxes for these properties that, you know, have limited side yards because from the street in, we take pretty close to 20 feet. I think it's 17 point some feet from the curb into where in this one case where the fence would be and then limits them to, and you know, it's fine to talk about square footage size of a shed, but sheds are sold in dimensions. And to go and buy a shed, you know, they're usually 10 by 10, eight by 10, 10 by 12. You can get something I think as small as five by 10, but I don't know what, how much use that would be to to, uh, to a family to use for storage. And I think that once we get, you know, they put up a fence in Sir Yard, you know, a separation of four feet or whatever the dimension is from the house, if there's a fire that's of any serious nature, if that's a concern, I don't think that distance is gonna make a great deal of difference there, you know? Uh, I think it's unreasonable to the land owners and I don't see any compromise after the debate and discussion we had last year uh, meeting on the on this point and uh, I have to agree with Ted I'm not really not comfortable with it and I think it's far too restrictive and I don't know why you know the truth is we're not going to enforce this and we're not going to police it and I all the years I've been here on council I said we should be careful 
on the rules and the bylaws that we put in place if we're not really going to enforce them or, or, or police them to some extent. So, you know, if we say no, people put up a fence, they're going to put a shed in there anyways. You know, uh, and, you know, unless one out of, I don't know how many, hundreds maybe, somebody, I don't know who would complain about a neighbor putting a shed inside their own fence. But without a complaint, it wouldn't even kick in a bylaw process. So I think there's a, it's far too restrictive and, and, and I, I don't think it adds any value to it. And it certainly is not considering uh, community requests and consideration of the taxpayer to be that restrictive to them in those property lines. So I certainly am not gonna support, support this as it is. Um, and I, you know, if we want to go ahead and have a vote on this tonight, I'd like a recorded vote on it. Um, so, uh, if there are no other questions. I guess that's the just, next. Just one, yeah. Mr. Mayor. Um, I kind of agree with all the points that everyone's been making uh, on the exterior lot, like on the exterior yard um, where the town owns the property. I mean, I mean, most people are going to have a fence up, and if they have a accessory building, any water runoff is going to run off into the town's property. But on the on the rear yard, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel right having a shed right on the property line, um, right up against somebody else's backyard. Uh, so I do I do like the buffer at the at the exterior yard uh, or the rear yard. I still think you know what 1.2 meters is a fair compromise um but the exterior side yard i i think it would be fine to be right on the property line or just inside if they if they have a if they have a fence uh i'm just i'm just concerned about the backyard neighbors having a shed um i mean we can't build anything right now uh on the property line so why are we going to have a shed right on the property line in a, in a backyard. So I would yeah, still I like the, you know, sorry, the focus is on the side exterior yards. That's, that is the, the, the debate uh, on tonight, the, the rear yard. I don't think there's an objection to that. Chris. Okay. So it's still, everyone's still fine with 1.2 meters. Yeah. Perfect. I don't, I don't, I don't see that as, or see anybody raising that. As okay. A, My okay. mistake. Yeah. That's good. Somebody else had their hand up then? No. Lynn, yeah. So I know it's not part of this, but again, um, I think of back of uh, the older homes in the community and how the garages on the side yards were built like adjoining for crying out loud. And to, again, I don't have any issue with somebody putting their shed on their exterior property line. I'm thinking of my little postage stamp backyard. And if I actually wanted a shed back there, if you made me come in four feet, I wouldn't even like uh, to put another five feet, I would be almost butt up against my windows of my house, which wouldn't be allowed. So again, I don't think we have a right to tell people that they can't put things inside of their properties, especially, um, the newer homes where the property, the green space that they actually have is getting, is so reduced compared to our older, uh, our older developments. So your property line is your property line. Like, you know, if you're, if you're six inches within your property line, you should have a right to build what you want to build there. Um, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying within read, like if it's a storage shed or as Dan was talking uh, um uh, a play structure for kids or whatever. This is your property. You're spending good tax dollars. So if it's not an obstruction of view for a safety of, of traffic flow or whatnot, we don't have a right to tell them what they can and can't do on this property. The other thing is if it's townhouses from the corner in, then there's already a, you know, an allowance across the back there that, that you have to you know, you have to allow people through your backyard. And, you know, uh, one of the uh, residents that is in that situation, he's an end unit in a townhouse. He's got a small deck off his back door. Then he has this four, almost five feet that he has to allow for people to move across his backyard to get to their backyard. And he would have, there's physically no space there for him. 
for a shed. So his alternative is a side yard for a for a shed. And I, I agree. Dan, did I see your hand or? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got no issue with the rear as uh, Chris has mentioned and, and you've mentioned, Mr. Mayor. My problem is the side yard of the neighbor as you to the right of the guy at the end. So you live at the end unit, I'm the next one in. In your backyard, you put up your shed on the property line, which is our property line. The peak of my shed is like this and the snow comes over onto my property instead of staying on yours. With this little bit of a buffer, the snow falls off and it stays in my yard, or pardon me, your yard. If it comes over to my side, kills my garden, then I'm gonna be all over you to say, hey, what's, what's with the snow in my place for? So that, you know, that inches or four feet maybe is too much, maybe it's only two, but there's gotta be some sort of a setback on the side to prevent the, the snow going to the neighbor's property on the inside. Does that make okay. sense? But if, if you're an end, we're talking about an end unit here in a side yard. So an end unit in a side yard has no neighbor to it, only town property to the curb. If you're an inside unit, then you only have a backyard and the backyard setback is what we were just discussing, right? Okay. And Mr. Okay. Mayor, if I may confirm then, um, so I have direction for when I come back to council with a bylaw, 1.2 meters is typically what's recommended as a minimum access path for people to get access to a rear yard. Um, so for instance, let's say an ambulance came to the front of your property and they had to get to the back of their property. Now I recognize that some uh, people do put gates in their backside yard, uh, but typically there is that allowance that is permitted uh, between accessory buildings and the main building. So am I hearing from council that they'd be supportive of a zero meter setback to either the fence on the property line or to the um, edge of the building, but not a zero meter setback to both? Because if it's zero meters to both, an accessory building could be attached to the house and go all the way to the edge of the property line. I'm sorry, Megan, I didn't get most of that. Maybe, so. maybe I can try. Can you hear me a bit better, sir? Yeah, you're clearer. Yeah, yeah I think what Megan's question is, you know, staff have made a recommendation um, based on, you know, review and that kind of thing. So Right now, we're suggesting a 1.2 meter side yard, exterior side yard, and a 1.2 meter sep building separation. But we're really here looking for direction from council because we know they had some concerns with those numbers. So we're, in order for Megan to prepare the bylaw, hopefully for the next meeting, we're looking to see whether council would be supportive of either one or the other. If we if we set this setback to the property line at zero, still establish a 1.2 meter to the house, or a zero meter to the house and a zero meter to the property line or or some combination thereof. We're really looking to see what council would prefer us to do in the bylaw. Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, did we, in discussion purposes has to be some assumptions here, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, this is a third weekend in a row I've been out on those lots measuring with residents looking at, you know, their issue. And I don't really see why we have to have a restriction either. Because they're gonna, they're not gonna put it tight against one or tight against the other. They aren't big enough to cover the the toll, you know. So there is going to be an access, whether they put the shed the shed tight to their house, which I kind of think may be unlikely, but or tight to the fence, then there is going to be space, you know, because the space, the overall measurement is bigger than a 10, 10 by 10 shed sort of thing, right? So I don't think that's really a a risk factor, you know. Okay. So, you know, I think maybe Megan wants to try and Megan, answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm listening really hard, Megan. It's just, you know. Thank you. I'll try and speak louder. I, I don't know why it's being garbled. Uh, but to confirm then, if staff were to recommend a zero meter setback to the edge of the house and a zero meter setback to the edge of the property line, someone could build an accessory building that took up all of that space. Would council prefer to see a 1.2 meter setback or a setback uh, from either the fence or the building so that there is access around the accessory building? 
that could give the property owner the flexibility of putting it right up against the fence or against the house, but it would have to be 1.2 meters on either side. Yeah, or, 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 or a meter. Why is it 1.2? It's, I'm just curious, why, why, where does that number come from? The 1.2 like meters Like a meter is approximately four feet, rear... right? Sorry, Megan. Oh, I was going to say the 1.2 meter setback came from the fact that that's the rear yard setback, and that's typically the width of the easement along the back of the townhouse units. And it's also, in many cases, the interior side yard setback. So to simplify it, uh, when the building department or planning staff or uh, someone's asked what my setbacks are, if we can say they're 1.2 meters for all of them, it's a little bit more straightforward than explaining, oh, this one's one and this one's 1 1.2 and so forth. So it'd be consistent, the measurements for either then. Okay, Lisa, yeah, that's uh, one or the other kind of works for me, yeah. Lisa? So my, now I have a question, Megan, um, with regards to what you were just saying um, and, and following along with what most of the flavor seems to be, um, as Councillor Grinson said, I mean, if this is their property, this is their property, and I really hesitate to put any limitations on what someone can do within their four, four fences or four walls or whatever you want. What, what is your concern if we went with zero, zero? Help me to understand, because I, I think I, I missed something you were saying. If we went zero, zero, which is basically no limits, this is your backyard, do what you need. What, what is your worry with that, please? If uh, the provisions were zero, zero, I can foresee many property owners building an accessory building uh, because it doesn't have to be a prefab shed that's brought in. It could be an accessory building that's constructed that would be attached to the edge of the house and would go all the way to the fence. And at 5.5, or sorry, at five meters in height, that would be a very large structure and um, could block access to the rear of the property as well. Follow up then, if I may, is there any way that we, I, I mean, I have no issue if they wanna build an accessory, again, it's their property. If the worry is access to the backyard, can that be the provision that we put in there saying you can do A, B or C as long as access is not in, you know, as long as there still is an access. So whatever that access be, whether it's the side yard or from the other way, is that an option? Yeah, uh, it's a good point. You said, sitting here again, visualizing it. If we wanted access to the backyard and we're on an end lot, we'd go to the backyard. You know what I mean? It, you know, they, they could have a gate in their fence that would give you that. You know, you're, you're not likely going to come all the way down the side of the house to get in when you could go in more directly from, from the end. It's not like they're, these are end units that have access from streets to their backyard. So I don't see it as a, as a concern really, you know. And 90% of them are more uneven fenced, you know. Ted, yeah. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure staff and yourself as well, when you're out looking at these buildings, are these typical where all utilities go in one end? Like hydro, water. I don't know, who are you asking then? Who? Oh, I didn't hear your question. Then. <laughs> On these side, your exterior side yards that face the street, is that not the location that normally utilities would go into the building? Normally you would put a what? Maybe the reception is on my end here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was asking if normally utilities would be on the side of the building. Would hydro go through there or water or sewer? I would think they'd come from the, the, front, the front. Right. Front, yeah. I would think they're yeah. I don't know. Well on the street you live but on as long as you have access in there, what's it gonna you're gonna matter, right? Well, if you go you zero, know, it just boils down to the fact that we, we, we you know, we define the size of the property mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the structures that can be built on them. So they pay these huge dollars for them and then pay huge taxes. And we limit their, their available land to do anything with, which is a normal family type of activity that happens. I, you know, I just don't think it's reasonable to the taxpayer to, to be restrictive like that, you know? Dan, then we're going to have a vote. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To sum up, I'm in favor of the zero and zero. 
if they're going to have a 10 foot square storage building that's permitted without a building permit, the time they per first put a nail into the side of their building, they require a building permit, whether it's five feet or four feet. So with a 10 foot square storage building not attached, it's zero, zero. And if they attach it to their to the end, then it's a building permit and that'll be all inspected after that. Good point, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Are we okay then? Everybody's... Can we, could we perhaps... Hey, okay, um, Megan, then we're going to... Official direction? Sorry? I was just going to suggest maybe we could get a mover and a seconder on a zero... Um, zero setback and a zero separation distance for an accessory shed and that if that's okay. counted. That's Lisa and Lynn. Okay, now we're gonna call for a vote. Mr. Merrick, will you clarify what we're voting on now? Exactly. Yes. The zero and zero setback that were moved by, by Lynn and Lisa. As an amendment to this report. Is this a separate motion? This is a separate yeah. motion direction, I think. So I would just, I guess I just need to have an all in favor on the original motion and then go with this motion after just. Okay, voting. but this would be a separate motion in my mind, right? Yeah, because the, the first motion does not direct anything specific just to bring a bylaw back forward at the yeah. forthcoming meeting, so. Yeah. Okay, so we vote on that and it's, and it's not passed Then this motion and that, and then there'll be a, a bylaw brought back at a later meeting, right? This motion, okay. the original motion really just says you'll give us direction and then the next yeah. motion gives us that direction. Okay. Well, just a minute now. We, 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 the existing motion has to be dealt with, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Kayla, according to Kayla. So we need a vote on that. Mm -hmm. If that loses, then we go in and the motion should say that we're giving direction to do this. Is that what you're, what you're saying to me? Sure. Yeah, I think I think the original motion just says that council directs staff to prepare a bylaw, but it doesn't tell us what it should be, and that's okay. why we need the second motion to tell us what that bylaw should say. Okay. So first, sorry, it was a little confusing the recommendation from staff. Okay, so we need a motion. We need to take a vote on the first motion then. Okay, so. All in favor. Okay, so that's lost. Nope. Oh. Carried. No, no, that's carried. Okay, the first motion was the original motion, right? Yeah. Would you okay, like me so to reread that, Mr. Mayor? I can reread it for you if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. But, you the know, I think the confusion here, just a minute. I think the confusion with council is that if, if the first motion is passed, then there's no second motion. No. Okay, so that you know, the, the first motion that's the direction it was going in, and I don't think that's the intent, right? No, we, we definitely okay. need the second motion to give us direction, and we already have a mover and seconder, so that's fine. Yeah, the second one. Okay, so now the vote for the second motion. I'm looking at Kayla here because you know. yeah, so I have a carried for the first motion and the second motion is on that you provide direction to staff on a zero zero setback. Okay, and a mover and seconder we have for that. Okay, is Lisa and Lynn? Just a minute, yeah, just a minute, Megan. We have the mover and seconder. I just want to make sure Kayla said so. Then Megan, yeah. To, to confirm the resolution that council may pass would be a zero meter setback and a zero meter setback. So. Separation. Zero meters right. to the exterior side yard setback, zero meters to the main building, and council is still in support of approximately 160 square feet as the, the size of the building in the exterior side yard setback. And were there any direction on height as well? So currently, accessory buildings can be five meters in height. Well, Good I year. think that's a lot, you know, you know, that would be the I wouldn't want to change that because you're talking about 20 feet there, you know, roughly, you know. Yeah. So, it, yeah, that's just but a good point for clarification, but that's the height. Then. Unless I see any objection from anybody I'm trying to know. Okay. May I ask one question? Yes. Um, Lynn? So I think in that bylaw, as Dan had mentioned, that if it is up against the main building, the home, 
that it is then required a building permit if it's if it's attached. I think that you have to spell that out for residents. If there is yeah. in any way an attachment to the home, it is now not an accessory building. It's it's a permit. It's an addition and then yes. requires a building permit. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to put that in there. Yeah. Okay. So again, you know, the thing is we're gonna give staff that direction. I just as long as staff are clear on all those points, you don't have to yeah. Okay. So. All right. So now the vote, please. All in favor? Second yeah. motion. I wanted I asked for the recorded vote, so oh, sorry. Okay. That's why I was waiting here at that. So you, you're looking for a recorded vote on the first motion, Mr. Mayor? No, I didn't uh, on the okay, second motion. On the yeah. Councillor Toner. No. Councillor McGee. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Burnett <sighs> appears to have dropped off. Uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Grinstead. Yes. County Councillor Lynch. Yes. Councillor Strike. Yes. And Mayor Stack. Yes. Councillor Burnett, can you hear? Oh, he's back now. I don't know if he can. Can you hear us, Tom? I guess not. He's done. Oh, muted. Hmm. No, what's carried? Anyways, it's a majority. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so uh, he's on the phone with somebody there now. Probably call on you, Marie. <laughs> Tom, if you hear, you're muted. Okay. Okay, so the next one is a biannual financial update. The council received report 21052506 as information. Okay, mover and a seconder, please. Dan and Chris. Yeah. Are you in now, Tom? No. No. Okay. Uh, who's <laughs> Jennifer? <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to focus on getting Tom in here. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hopefully my audio will be all right um, for the presentation. Yours is clear. Okay, great. <laughs> I think Kill is just putting my slideshow up here. Um, so uh, thank you, Mayor Stack and members of council. Um, I'm here today to present the uh, May 2021 biannual financial update. I'll give a little bit of background. So um, as per the procedural bylaw, uh, the treasurer will provide council with biannual financial reports. And really the intent of the report is to provide council that clear picture um, of the town's financial status, um, identify any financial matters of concern and update council on progress and improvements made to date on finance related activities. So it's kind of a two for one tonight. You got to hear about 2020 from the auditors and then tonight I'll give you a update on where 2021, 2021 is sitting. So of course, I'm gonna give, of course, the COVID-19 caveat attached to the numbers is basically that, you know, COVID-19 really does continue to impact municipal operations and services uh, with declines in things like user-free revenues, uh, experiencing additional costs. Uh, and while we try to mitigate these impacts associated with, um, you know, cost-saving measures, it does create some uncertainty um, in those uh, current year and future operations. Um, the duration of impact is still continuing to be unknown. Uh, it's not possible to reliably estimate uh, to its fullest extent that impact on future periods. However, we are really closely monitoring it and um, assessing the impact on town operations and we'll report back any areas of con significant concern to council um, if something arises. Um, so you can see here a snapshot on this slide. This is your 2021 year to date to April 30th. Uh, 
So the first column, um, 2020 April, I'm showing what last year things looked like in April. Uh, then I've got the 2021 April column, and then I've got your 2021 budget, so you can see that comparison. Um, I changed how this chart looked a little bit than I do normally in the bian um, biannual financial report. I made this one look more like counselor, um, council's um, tab one of your budget binder. So you can kind of see that uh, similar uh, format. Um, so what you can um, see here, um, I've got the revenues at the top, which is just your taxation and some of your grants. And then the expense section, we're actually netting them um, against um, the other revenues like user fees uh, to be able to get that net balance for all those various areas. So if we move forward to the next slide, uh, you can see back from that past slide that overall for 2021, we are on par or even slightly ahead of the 2020 figures over that same time period of up to the end of April, um, which I think this is a fairly positive sign given that last year in 2020, two and a half of those months, um, January to mid-March was actually um, what we would consider pre-COVID and they ran a fairly normal year for those first two and a half months and we're comparing against that. Um, another positive item is that our winter control expenses this year um, are fairly low, um, given the less weather events that we had. Currently, right now, we're sitting at expenses of 337000 compared to last year at the same time of 483000 Now, of course, with winter control, there is a corresponding offset for internal equipment rental um, for equipment that we use across our budget that we're seeing um, with that as well. Um, another positive area of the budget that's doing well is building services. Um, the revenues that are coming in um, have already surpassed um, the annual budgeted revenues uh, by over 70,000 uh, and we're only in, and that's only up till the end of April. Um, and another positive is that right now our water, wastewater revenues are slightly up uh, compared to where we're at at this point in the year um, for 2020. A few items to monitor. Uh, we are still seeing uh, those impacts of the reduced recreation user fee revenues uh, due to COVID-19 and the closure of the Nick Smith Centre for a number of months. Uh, and you can really see that back on my first chart there where you can see those year to date net costs, the revenue less expenses. Uh, right now you can see that in 2021 they're sitting $47,000 higher uh, than they were in 2020. So the cost of, uh, of, of um, business for that uh, is costing us more right now than it was in 2020. So we do have that impact right now. Um, and landfill tipping revenues. Right now they're on par with 2020 but it's just something they're going to want to monitor um, over the summer uh, just to see if they increase or decrease and where that's going to set us heading into the fall. I wanted to touch on our safe uh, restart funds uh, because this is really that funding that's provided to us by the government uh, that's really intended to help offset those COVID-19 operating pressures. So what we have right now is in 2020, we received um, about 256,000 from the federal um, and provincial governments for these oh. safe restart funds. We carried forward a little over 213,000 into 2021 and we received a second allotment in 20. 21 of 51,000. So for our current operating budget, we have approximately 264,000 of these safe research funds uh, available. Um, what I'm showing here currently is just, I showed you those uh, recreation impacts were about $47,000 down where we wanna be with our recreation uh, figures. And I also put on here the McNabb Brayside Joint Use Agreement. Um, if we follow the same kind of process as last year, um, a, uh, we did uh, give a discount based on the, the grant for the number of months that the facility was closed. If we do something similar this year, I put um, an estimated impact in there of about 75,000. And so right now coming off that 264, it leaves us with about 141,000 of safe restart funds um, still going forward uh, into 2021. Uh, moving topics slightly, I uh, wanted to give council a quick update on tax arrears. So in January of 2021, uh, we sent out 40 registered letters um, to properties that were two years uh, plus in arrears. Um, currently today, only 17 of them remain outstanding, which is pretty good, um, and will be registered with a tax arrears uh, certificate. Um, and even over the last few days, I think that that number has gone down. Um, and looking back one year in 2020, uh, we did end up having 10 properties registered uh, with a tax arrear certificate as well. Um, and out of that 10, only four remain outstanding. Um, and out of these four, um, they will become eligible for tax sale at about approximately the end of September 2021, um, if uh, they're not brought back into good standing uh, by that point. 
Uh, the tax arrears um, as a percentage of current levy is still well within those provincial low risk thresholds as the auditors um, uh, were addressing tonight. Um, and also our 2021 tax rate bylaws, it's on the tonight's agenda for council's consideration as well under the bylaws. Moving over to our 2021 capital, um, it's a big year for capital. We have about 59 projects, 41 in the current capital, uh, 18 from prior year with about over $6 million um, of investment uh, when we include the prior year WIP funds into that. Uh, significant progress has already uh, been made. The operations department has really jumped out there and gotten a lot of tenders uh, out the docket uh, early, which is great. So we have over 60% of our projects already in progress or complete. Uh, we did have some current concerns this year on what impact the pandemic would be having on those tender prices. Um, but so far, luck we have it, um, the majority of, of our completed tenders so far have been either on or under budget. Uh, I gave a couple quick examples here of Alicia Street, uh, the Nick Smith Center paving and our water tower uh, repairs and repaints. Those were kind of three of our, our, our big ones and all three have come uh, either on budget or, or under, which is great. Wanted to touch quickly on some successful grants. Um, the town's been successful in a couple of them. We've got our inclusive community grant. It's about 59,000. Um, and this is for some Nick, Nick Smith Center wayfinding signage. I know John um, last week spoke to the ISIP Greenstream um, grant of about $2 million. And that was for the 400 millimeter river crossing water main replacement. Uh, we do get a gas tax top up that should arrive later this year um, and we're looking to uh, apply this to the 400 millimeter river crossing water main replacement and that will help bolster that water reserve um, that we're trying to get out of that deficit position. Um, and Canada Summer Jobs, we received about $15,000 um, and that's to help cover partial coverage for about five summer students. Uh, switching topics over to financial reporting, um, the 2020 consolidated financial statements, you had the presentation by the auditors uh, tonight um, and attached also uh, later on um, in this uh, agenda, we do also have the bylaw to adopt those statements. Um, the auditors also did include um, a management letter with the consolidated financial statements. There was two items on the management letter to be looking at. Uh, one was for more timely receipt of library statements and then that will help with improved timelines for our municipal reporting. Um, and it also talked about uh, recommending an increase to our working capital reserve. And um, on tonight's bylaw, you can see through the capital surplus bylaw, we're actually completing that um, by having a bit of a bump up on the 2020 general surplus allocation to the working capital reserve. Uh, financial information uh, return. Uh, Estelle and I are busy working away at the FIRs right now uh, in order to complete and submit it by our May 31 uh, deadline. And I'll make sure I send an email out to council confirming uh, whenever we do get that submitted. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Okay, council comments, questions? Nothing, nobody? Uh, got one when we talked a little bit about last week, whether we should maybe uh, by letter make a, a formal request to the library about the timing of the reporting so that we can support your efforts to know it on that auditor's comment. Sure, so we can draft up a letter. If we could do that, I think it would be worthwhile. Uh, I know it's only part way through the year, but maybe you know uh, we could take a look at our total sort of, I don't want to say surplus yet, but there are surplus dollars in there for sure that uh, you know there's some significant gains on the contracts when I looked at some of them that get into the four and $500,000 range and, and uh, Maybe staff could take a look at those and give us some information in the next meeting or so, just what they think maybe be the best places. I'm thinking of the water reserves as a, as a, a you know, an ongoing issue that we need to manage and maybe some of them, those funds can be considered for that. Okay. Nobody else? All in favor then? Carried, thank you. Next is the OPP board proposal. Sorry. The Council of the Corporation of Town of Armpire hereby supports a Renfrew Detachment Board composition of 11 members as follows. One council representative from each municipality, two community appointees, being one resident of either Armpire, Greater Madawaska, or McNabb Brayside, and one resident of either Admaston, Bromley, Horton, Renfrew, or Whitewater Region and two provincial appointees. And further, the council hereby appoints one member of council as a representative for the town of Armprior, 
and further that a copy of this resolution be forwarded to other Renfrew detached municipalities for inclusion in the submission to the province. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Lisa and Dan, everybody's moved location over here now, so mm -hmm. I was trying to spread it around. Uh, Robin? Yeah, th thank you, sir. Um, just a quick report for Council to bring up to speed on what's happening with the OPP detachments in Ontario. Um, as Council is well aware, we get our OPP detachment from what's called the Renfrew detachment um, of the, of the uh, OPP, and, and that detachment uh, covers seven municipalities. Ironically, they're the same seven as our leg group and, and the same group that's working together on the community safety and well-being plan with the OPP. So the town of Renfrew, Armprior, the townships of Edmonston, Bromley, Greater Madawaska, Horton, uh, McNabb, Brayside, and uh, Whitewater Region. And I'll just note that uh, of interest, um, the other detachment in the Ottawa Valley, the Upper Ottawa Valley detachment, uh, also uh, provides service to a portion of Adamston, Bromley, and Whitewater Region. Um, but, but both of those municipalities are asking the province to look at the line between the detachments and, and try to get um, the, the, the uh, municipality completely within the Renfrew uh, detachment area for ease. Um, just so Council is aware that Ontario passed the uh, Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, which was Bill, 19, uh, Bill 68, establishing uh, a community, um, and, it, and it established the Community Safety and Policing Act, which once in force will repeal the Police Services Act. And section 67 of, of the new act uh, requires that there be um, a, an OPP detachment board or more than one board for each of the detachments of the OPP that provide policing to a municipality um, or a First Nation community. And um, the ministry will be required to develop some regulation related to the composition of each um, OPP detachment board. Um, and so to do that, they created what they call the no OPP detachment board framework. And it's to provide uh, civilian governance to the 326 municipalities and 43 First Nations, including Iron Pride, that receive direct policing services from the OPP. And the, the purpose of um, enhancing civilian uh, governance is to ensure that each municipality um, has an opportunity to represent uh, their local perspectives and needs uh, to the OPP and provide opportunities for municipalities to collaborate in our efforts to improve community safety, which as I, as I mentioned, we're, we're doing with the uh, joint community uh, safety and well-being plan. So um, in order to ensure these objectives of the uh, detachment board framework are met, the ministry developed a flexible approach and basically suggested that, that we have our own um, uh, agreed to proposal with respect to the detachment board uh, for Renfrew County, uh, Renfrew detachment, I should say, not county, and um, we submit that proposal as a group all over Ontario. They're requiring municipalities to do so. Uh, the proposals have to meet a certain criteria, one being that there be a minimum of five members, a second that there be a minimum of 20% community citizen membership, and those community uh, citizens cannot be councillors or employees of a municipality. And, and thirdly, that 20% of the membership be provincial appointees. Um, so we don't have to at this time recognize a, or an appoint an, a member of council to sit on a board because those boards will not be in place until uh, the fall at the earliest. But we do have to present our, or submit our proposal by June 7th. So in anticipation of the need to submit this proposal, the seven leg member uh, municipality CAOs uh, got together to discuss what could be uh, the composition of our board for Ramford County. And we agreed by consensus that we'd seek support from our, our respective councils for the proposal uh, of the detachment uh, layout as, as indicated in the, in the motion, which is 11 members, one council representative from each of the seven municipalities, and then two community appointees, one sort of from the Western side and one sort of from the Eastern side and then the two provincial appointees. And that will get us to the right, um, right mix uh, in accordance with the framework. Um, as I said, the citizen employee appointees cannot be council or employees, but we are trying to look, we would be trying to look for citizen members who have some expect expertise or experience um, around um, community safety or delivery of OPP policing services, um, maybe some mental health or social services expertise or some seniors. Uh, who understands seniors' concerns and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, as I said, each 
um, of the leg municipalities has brought forward the same resolution to that council. I think five out of the seven have um, already uh, uh, approved that resolution and gone with the recommendation as provided. Uh, I did provide a couple of options in the, the staff report, be there considering um, because we can't have more than one board per detachment um, or maybe some alternative to the board composition, but we're confident that by having one representative from each municipality's council, we'll get good representation on one board. And by having just one board, we have a good size um, that makes it, um, makes it manageable, but um, still very effective as a, as a, um, a detachment board. Uh, so I, I think that's pretty much everything I want to explain from the report, but if the council has any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to try and address. Well, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Way back when we used to be part of the uh, OPP police board, then we had our own a separate police board that met at the, at the mall. We, when they were part of this police board, the people were paid to be part of the board other than the councillors, which were Jack Lemert, if I remember. Anyways, going forward with this new composition, the two civilians, I call them civilians, two residents from one from each other municipalities, plus the two provincial people, will they be paid? And if so, who's going to pay them? Thank you. It's a fair question, and I uh, I don't believe that they've answered that question for us as yet. I think once they um, complete the regulations, we'll learn more. But um, my my sense will be that it will be local local funds that would be required to uh, to compensate. Okay. Anyone else? No. All in favor then? Yes. Okay. okay. That got four. Thank you. It's carried. <clears throat> Okay, so the next one is our first proclamation on Seniors Month. The Council proclaimed June 2021 as Seniors Month in the town of Arncrier. Move on a seconder, please. Lynn, Chris, Kayla, are you going to read the proclamation? Yes, whereas Seniors Month is an annual nationwide celebration and where seniors have contributed and continue to contribute to the life and vibrancy of this community, and where seniors continue to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and important and active members of this community, and whereas their contributions past and present warrant appreciation and recognition and their stories deserve to be told, and whereas the health and well-being of seniors is in the interest of all and further adds to the health and well-being of the community, and whereas the knowledge and experience seniors pass on to us continues to benefit all. Therefore, be a resolved that the Town of Armbar does hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 as Seniors Month in the town of Armbar and encourage all residents to recognize and celebrate the accomplishment of our seniors. Okay, any comments? All in favor then, please? Carried, thank you. And the next proclamation, please. The council proclaimed June 2021 as Recreation and Parks Month in the town of Armbar. Move and seconder, please. Okay, Dan and uh, Lisa. Whereas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whereas in the town of Armpire, we are fortunate to have a variety of recreation and park systems providing countless recreational opportunities for residents and visitors. And whereas recreation enhances quality of life, balance living and lifelong learning, helps people live happier and longer, develops skills and positive image in children and youth, develops creativity and builds healthy bodies and positive lifestyles and Whereas recreational participation builds family unity and social capital, strengthens volunteer and community development, enhances social interaction, creates community pride and vitality, and promotes sensitivity and understanding to cultural diversity. In other words, parks, open space, and trails provide active and passive outdoor recreation opportunities, help maintain clear, clean air and water, and promote stewardship of the natural environment. And whereas recreation, therapeutic recreation, and leisure education are essential to the rehabilitation of individuals who have become ill or disabled or disadvantaged or who have demonstrated antisocial behavior. And whereas the benefits provided by recreation programs, services, and parks and open space reduce health care and social service costs, serve to boost the economy, economic renewal and sustainability, enhance property values, attract new business, increase tourism, and curb employee absenteeism. Whereas the Town of Barnbury will take part in the participation Community Better Challenge, providing easy, fun, and safe ways to get the community moving and socially connecting through physical activity and sports. 
Therefore, be a result that the town of Armpire in recognition of the benefits and values of recreation and parks does hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 as Recreation and Parks Month in the town of Armpire. Any comments? All in favor then, please. Carried, thank you. And uh, a third proclamation, please. The council proclaimed June 21st to June 27th as Pride Week in the town of Armpire. Let's move and seconder, please. Lisa and Lynn, comments? All in favor then, please. Would you like me to read that proclamation? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Sorry. Whereas the town of Armpire strives to be a safe, welcoming and inclusive community for all. And whereas the pride rainbow flag is an important symbol of hope and acceptance for LGBTQs youth and adults who continue to face stigma, discrimination, isolation, and bullying in their home, workplaces, and community spaces simply for being who they are. And whereas this puts LGBTQS individuals at elevated risk of mental health issues, substance abuse, homelessness, and suicide. And whereas the colors of the pride rainbow flag represent the diversity of the LGBTQ2S community, the color red signifies life, orange is healing, yellow is sunlight, green represents nature, blue symbolizes serenity, peace, and harmony, and finally purple represents spirit. And whereas flying the rainbow flag at Town Hall during Pride Week symbolizes the town celebration of diversity and support for the LGBTQ2S community. Therefore, be it resolved that the Town of Iron Pride proclaim the week of June 21st to 27th, 2021 as Pride Week in the town of Armpire and encourage all residents to take note of this special week and consider what steps we can take to make our community a safe, inclusive place for all, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I'm getting a little tired. Mm -hmm. Any comments? All in favor then? Just carried, thank you. And our next one is uh, community reports minutes, please. The council received the following minutes of advisory committee meetings as information. Community Development Advisory Committee of February 16th, 2021. The Corporate Services Advisory Committee meeting of March 1st, 2021. And the Operations Advisory Committee meeting minutes of March 15th, 2021. Mover and seconder, please. Okay, Chris and Lisa, any comments? Dan, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The operations committee has one resolution that we'd ask council to pass dealing with opioids. And I'd ask Kayla to read the resolution if possible. Give me one second. Okay. And I will bring that resolution up. Okay. So the, the operations advisory committee recommend that council write a letter addressing the opioid crisis, asking the school boards to post information on their electronic signs and further that more information regarding this crisis and ways to assist the community be posted on the town's website and app. Okay, question here now, because we were gonna move on the three reports. This is a separate yeah. uh, motion. motion. We finished the first one first or this one? The first okay. one first, and then we can move on to this one. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, we have a move and a second for the first one on the three reports. Can I get an all in favor on that? Okay, carried, thank you. And now this second motion, I need a mover and seconder. Dan, and, uh, Chris, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. With, with your permission, could we ask the uh, committee chair to identify their committee members and thank them for their participation? Sure, we can do that. So on behalf of the operations, uh, Mr. Mayor, we have our deputy chairs, Chris Toner, our members are Dave Coro, Emily LaPrade, Phil McLeod, John Shane, and Gabriel Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, who's uh, Ted is operations, I think. Yes. Uh, as chair of the committee, uh, Lisa McGee is the vice chair, Andy Tams is a member, Chris Cooper is a member, Daryl O'Shaughnessy is a member, and we're going to get the rest of them here. Lori Van Wick, committee member, and Caitlin Robillard, committee member. Okay, and uh, Lynn, you're chairing the community development? With vice chair, uh, 
Councillor Tom Burnett, Citizen Member Peanut, Peter Annis, Dennis Turpin, Guy Bain, Neil Caldwell, and Seth Molina. Okay, thank you to all of you. So then uh, we have no notice motions. Dan, County Report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's five items. One is the County Planning Department has a new intern, Alex Benzi, who will be with us until the end of August. The Summer Student Summer and Starter Company Program is in place with five openings with the opportunity to receive $3,000 in starter fees. In that this taxation night, I thought I'd share what the county gets from a couple of municipalities. Petawawa was the biggie with 8,900,000 with 18%. Laurentian Valley is next with 5 million with 10%, followed by Armprior, 4,200,000 with 8.6, and McNabb Brayside is 3,696,000 with 7.9% of the county's coppers that come in. On the 18th of May, the Algonquin Trail Advisory Committee recommended through development and property to the County Council that the tender submitted by GP Splinter Forest Products Construction, Pembroke, Ontario, in the amount of $392,200 plus HST for the supply and delivery of quarry limestone crush on the Algonquin Trail for a distance of 21 Ks. This amount is $108,000 under budget. In another note, under the operations side, I noticed that uh, Jennifer said that our ops had saved some money. County at this point with signed tenders for operations is 1.3 million under. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, the next county meeting is uh, this Wednesday, which is tomorrow. And this month I've attended three meetings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, the comment, I, I took a look at those uh, five or six developing communities are going to say development communities that are tax assessment is going to the county and it's about 47% of the total residential tax assessment. So just to back up my position from two weeks ago, the uh, dollars going there. We have one correspondence package, Caleb. Correspondence package number I-21 May 10 be received and the information filed accordingly. Mover and seconder, please. Dan and Lisa, comments? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Only a couple. Uh, page 22, if you're between 18 and 19 years old in Ontario, is offering a 10-week pre-apprenticeship program for trades in the construction business through Brook Restoration Limited, which is located in Ottawa. So you have to do a bit of traveling, but you get a free 10-week uh, how to be a construction guy. On page 24, the Ontario government is investing $35 million to increase enrollment in nursing, which will see approximately 1,130 new practical nurses and 870 registered nurses into the healthcare system. So anybody want to be a nurse, there's a good opportunity. And the last one, Mr. Mayor, again, back to finance. MPAC is sending out property assessment notices to property owners that will see an increase of 13 billion in new assessment for municipalities. So to the general manager of finance, I'm a bit, a bit confused with this notice. The validation of January 1, 2016, we are to provide our homeowners with a bilingual insert to explain this. Could you please summarize this impact notice? Thanks. Hey, okay, Jennifer. Um, so for MPAC, what they've asked us to do is help them get the word out. So what MPAC has is right now they're sending out 38,000 of these notices to various different properties in Ontario. And these notices will go to properties that underwent either a major construction or a renovation, and therefore the valuation of the property had to be reassessed. Um, and what that 2016 number is in there is that really is the last time properties were valued in Ontario. Everyone is still using this 2016 date. Um, these these uh, assessments were then implemented across a four year period. So that took us from 2017 all the way to 2020. 
So what's happened with COVID is that the new assessment was supposed to have been rolled out in 2020 to be implemented in 2021, and that has been delayed. We have heard from Impact as well that it'll also be delayed this year. So it'll also be, uh, we'll still be using that old 2016 assessment values leading into our next set of um, um, taxation valuation. Uh, but really these notices, it's really just to help um, explain to those property owners that went through that major construction of what their uh, notices mean. Um, often with the municipality, we get those phone calls and uh, we can help walk those property owners through those questions and direct them to impact and to the spot where they can get the proper information. Just, uh, I was going to make a comment down again, it, you know, when they do the next assessments and like we talked earlier tonight during the audit report, the value of real estate, people need to be prepared for a shock when their assessments come in, you know, to, uh, and, uh, the taxes are going to are going to be taking a hike for a large number of people. I would suspect it also means that we, as a municipality, need to try to look at that windfall. It may not be the right word, but that chunk of cash is going to come once they do this assessment within a year or so afterwards. Dan, yeah. that was uh, my comments, Mr. Mayor. Being a homeowner, time to sell oh. now and get into an apartment, so I won't have the taxes. <laughs> might be right behind you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, uh, no other comments on the correspondence? All in favor then? Carry, thank you. Uh, bylaws, and uh, there's six of them. We need to pull out that number one so that I can hand that over to the deputy mayor. Are there any of the other five of concern to anybody? No? Okay, so we'll do, I guess, the first one first, Kayla. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm that the following bylaw B and is hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 717321 Encroachment Agreement 89 John Street North. I guess we have an acting Deputy Mayor here again. Uh, yes, we do. Yes. Yep. Uh, do I do an all in favor? I need a mover and a seconder, Mr. Oh, Deputy sorry. Mayor. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Dan Lynch, second by Councillor Lisa McGee. Perfect. And All in favor? Point. Carried. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So then the other five. Um, that the following bylaws be and are hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 717421 adopt the 2020 consolidated and audited financial statements. 717521. 2021 tax rate, 717621, adopt 2020 surplus shortfall, shortfall funds, 717721, release and deregistration of site plan, 717821, repeal and replace 716121, lift, dedicate, and transfer 0 0.3 meter reserve. Marshall's big mouth. Right, move and second, please. Lynn and Chris, any comments? All in favor? Carry. Thank you. We have announcements now, please. No announcements, Dan? Oh, okay. Uh, I have uh, just a couple of quick ones. One, I want to congrat congratulate the Armpit Nab Archives on the AAO's Institutional Award that was announced this past week. And the other one uh, to uh, Graham and his team. Uh, Friday, when the announcement came out that splash pads could open, I talked to him because I knew I would be getting a couple calls as I did. And he and his team got on it and it was open. Sunday, I was down there and there was probably eight or 10 kids, even though it was a cooler day, playing in it. So thanks for that. Do I have any media questions? I do not see any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a closed session. Move into closed, please. The council move into closed session regarding A2 closed session matters pursuant to section 239 2B of the municipal act to discuss personal matters about identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, annual awards, and student bursaries. B1 matter pursuant to section 239 2C of the municipal act 2001 to discuss proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board purchase of land. Okay, move and second. Uh, Dan and Chris, okay, 